but we don't we know it's not right but we really don't want to be an outcast but here's a young man he's put in a very awkward situation and he makes the right decision anyway and of course it cost on his plum of a job and he says the uh, Potiphar who's the captain of the Egyptian deals put him into the, the uh, Pharaoh's prison and uh, you know, you can be assured it wasn't a pleasant place, although it did have the upper echelon type people in there, the king's uh, people that offended the king. And uh, once again, we see the hand of God. We see him being blessed, and the guy that's in charge of the prison notices that uh, whatever this guy gets involved with, it goes really well. And so he puts on charge of what's going on inside the prison. After all, he really doesn't want to mess with that, you know. And so uh, everything goes well. And then we see these, uh, these two guys that get on the outs with Pharaoh. You know, they're, uh, one of them's the baker and the other's the cupbearer. And these are the guys that were in charge of, uh, one, making sure Pharaoh's food was good, that it wasn't poison. Uh, and whatever they'd done it had upset Pharaoh. And he, you see, Pharaoh wasn't a, knee-jerk sort of reaction guy because he put him in prison while he figured out what he wanted to do with them. He didn't just off with their heads, you know, or sell them off to slavery or whatever. And they had these dreams. And, you know, they've been part of Pharaoh's household. They've been uh, the upper crust of the servants. And they're used to uh, having all these other people around them like them. But here in prison, they don't have anybody to interpret their dreams. They don't have their buddy that's the wise man to Pharaoh to interpret the dream, and it's bothersome. You know, uh, and their, their countenance looks, there's something wrong. Pharaoh can see, I mean, Joseph can see that these guys are very unhappy. Something's really troubling them, and he talk, stops, takes time to talk with them, you know. Uh, it's hard sometimes to take time to talk to somebody when they're having trouble. After all, I've got enough problems of my own, if you want to know the truth of the matter. But we need to have that attitude. When we see somebody hurting or having trouble, uh, you know, it never hurts to ask a question or be open to it. And that's what Joseph does. And uh, he tells them right off the bat that God's the one that gives interpretations of dreams. So the cupbearer tells on his dream and he's, boy, it's good news. He says, uh, you know, in three days, you'll be put back in your position. Pharaoh's going to forgive you, and you're going to be back doing that job. And it's a plum of a job. So the, uh, the baker, he says, okay, I might as well get my interpreted too. And he tells Joseph, and it's completely opposite. In three days, he's going to lose his head and be fed to the crows. Uh, but, but Joseph asked the uh, cup bear he says he says I have been wrong he said I don't deserve to be in this prison I didn't do anything wrong to start with I want you to please remember me to Pharaoh maybe there's something you can do to get me out of this place he didn't ask to be released he just wanted out of that prison that's why I say we know it wasn't a great place to be but of course the uh, cup bear when he gets back in that job is not about to rock the boat you know I mean Pharaoh was mad at me before, look what happened. I'm not gonna take any chances. So he doesn't remember Joseph. And then a, a period of time goes by and then Pharaoh has that, those, those dreams. He has these two weird dreams that really bug him and he wants to know what they mean. And he calls his wise men, his dream interpreters, and uh, they don't even make anything up. They don't have any idea what those dreams mean. And we see the hand of God in that too, you know. And so uh, the uh, cupbearer, he's still kind of like, I don't know if I really want to do anything. But he says, hey, uh, you know, when I was in prison, this is what happened. This Hebrew, he's a foreigner, you understand. Not one of our people. But he interpreted the dream for me and the, and the cake guide. He, uh, he was right on both counts. So Pharaoh, I mean, he's desperate to know what's, what these dreams mean. He immediately sends for this guy. They go and grab him out of the prison. They wash him up, shave him, put on some clothes on him, make him presentable in the court. And you got to remember, in the court of Pharaoh, there were no ugly people. There were no 
yeah, there was no second class citizens there. This is, this is, you know, everything's great for Pharaoh. I mean, he's the guy that demands the best. After all, he's, just, he's considered the son, uh, the son of the sun god. And so there's nothing. And they make sure he's presentable when he's presented to Pharaoh. <clears throat> and we know if, that he listens, he tells Pharaoh, he says, interpretations from God. It's nothing, I, it's nothing magical about me or anything that makes me wise. He said, just tell me we dream and we'll see if God will give us the interpretation. And we know about the seven cows. You know, these seven cows came up out of the Nile and they grazed on this beautiful pasture and they got fat and lovely. And then these seven ugly cows, which have never been allowed in Egypt to start with, uh, they come up and eat the fat cows and they don't get any fatter. And uh, the second dream was basically the same thing. Had this great production, you know, hundredfold type harvest of this grain, and then these scrawny, wind-blown, drought-driven grain comes up and destroys the fat ears, and they don't get any better. And Joseph tells them, well, here's the interpretation. He says, we're going to have seven years of great surplus. God's going to bless the land. And then we're going to have seven years of famine, and everything's going to be really bad. And he says, God gave you these dreams, two of them, to assure you this is actually what's going to happen. This is set in stone. You can hang your hat on it. And he, said, he tells Pharaoh, if we've returned over to chapter 41, uh, about 30, 33, it says, Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food of those good years that are in coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh for the food in the city and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so the land may not perish through the famine. Joseph not only tells them the interpretation of dreams, Joseph tells them what he needs to do. Now think about it. If I knew a famine was coming, I'd want to put up as much as possible. I mean, that'd just be my knee-jerk reaction. That's probably Pharaoh's too. But Joseph says, all you need to put up is 20% of the crops. And you'll have plenty of land, money or plenty of food for the people. Put it in store cities. And, you know, they've dug up some of these uh, large grain silos and things were built and grain was stored in. It's unimaginable. Just think about it. Not only did they store up enough food for all their own people. I mean, they were a large, very prosperous nation. They've stored up enough to sell it to other people during these bad times, as we see here in a little bit in the story. And, of course, uh, Pharaoh thought that was a great idea, and he told his people around him, he says, uh, Sounds like we got the guy we need. He's favorable to the gods. He's pretty wise. He's told us a great plan. I think we need to put him in charge. So uh, he's, he, he puts, he, he can see the spirit of God working in on him, and he realizes that this is the kind of guy they need to be in charge of this project to make it a success. And, uh, you know, so <clears throat> how old is Joseph when all this is occurring? 30. So think about it. Even if he was 19 years old when he sold off, this has been 11 years later, he's, he's finally got to this point. He's had ups and downs, but he always remains faithful. You know, he goes from being the favorite son of his dad with all the luxuries that involved, sold off into slavery. Rises up the head of the household, pretty prosperous household. And then he's back down into a worse situation. He's put into the king's prison. And now he's back to the top. And, you know, as we talk about Sunday, that'd be pretty easy for a young man to be pretty arrogant when that happens. You know, uh, great prosperity. He's got a good title. Um, you know, what, what, you know, not only was Pharaoh put on charge of it, what did Pharaoh do for Joseph at that point? Second in command. He 
That's right, except for Pharaoh himself. He, he dressed him in fine clothes. He had him ride around in his best chariot. He gave him an Egyptian name. He wanted to make this guy an Egyptian. He was adopted one of the Egyptians. And then on top of that, just to make sure everybody understood, he married him off to the priest's daughter. That's their state religion. Now, that's a pretty good end. If you're going to be welcome into the family, that's about as good as it gets without marrying Pharaoh's daughter. But the second best person to marry is the priest's daughter because he's got the ear of Pharaoh. And we're going to see some benefits come about the, the how Pharaoh thought about the priest and their, their gods. So you think about it. Pharaoh recognizes what's needed. Now, we're going to see this again when Nebuchadnezzar takes off the people, right? He caught... The ones he likes, he gives them names of his culture. They're trying to simulate this young man into their culture. And it would have been pretty easy for, at this point for him to think, man, I got it great. I'm Pharaoh's right-hand man. I'm married to the priest's daughter. No problem. I'll just go to the temple. Everything will be great from now on. But he keeps his faith. That's the difference. And, you know, it couldn't have been easy. Your wife says, how come we can't go to church with dad? You know, how come you never go to the worship service with us? You know, it doesn't tell us that, but you know that's what was going on. And, uh, but, but he sticks to his grounds. And it's, it's uh, so, you know, he's there somewhere, like I said, quite a period of time. You know, 11, 13 years, somewhere in that period of time. And he's grown a lot. And then the this, this, this seven years of feast comes along. And he's busy. He's got to build all these store silos, and he's got to collect all the harvest. He's got people to help him, but he's in charge. Remember, he's the guy that's responsible to keep Pharaoh informed, make sure they have plenty of food stored up. And during this time, he has two sons. And... Uh, what do we know about his sons? What did he name them? And what, why did he name them that? Yeah, he's got a wife, now he's got a family. He has his first son. He says... God has brought me joy. God's made me forget the hardship. But it's, it's not an Egyptian name that he gives them. It's still a connection back to his people. And then he has a second son. And uh, I'm drawing a blank now, let's see. His name was Ephraim because he says, I've been twice blessed. I've had two sons. And, you know, he's, he's definitely got a new start to his life. He's got two boys, he's got a wife, he's in a powerful position, and he looks like he's set for life, and he was, really. But, it did, but, it, but he kept his faith. And you know, we, the, the book skips over that section, but what do we know happens next? After seven years, he has both his sons, we don't know how old they are, but then the famine begins. And the famine is not just Egypt. It's that whole Middle Eastern part of the world. And it gets so bad that nobody has food. So it was probably two or three years into the famine. I would say probably three plus. His brothers come to town. They don't have any food left back home. Dad says, we've got to go to Egypt to buy it. I've heard they're selling grain down there. His brothers come. You know... I don't know about you, but if my brothers had treated me that way, I, I wouldn't have been very welcoming to them. And to be honest with you, Joseph really wasn't either. You know, he didn't make himself known to them. He, uh, you know, he had mixed emotions about their coming. But remember, these guys had done him pretty, pretty raw. They'd sold on to slavery. And he knows their reputation. Uh, they're pretty much connivers. They'll do anything to get their own way. 
And so <clears throat> they don't recognize him. And, uh, and he, you know, he asked them all these questions. And of course, you know, he really, what he really wants to know is how's dad and my little brother doing back home? You know, that's what he's really concerned about. But, you know, I can just imagine, I put myself in his place. Did they kill my little brother like they tried to do me? Because he would have been dad's favorite after I was gone. You know, and what about dad? Is he still alive? He gets, he, he's a good questioner. He gets these questions out, gets his information in. And then uh, we know the story. They buy, and when they get back, or after they leave, they get the first stop, they find the money in their bags. They're kind of concerned at that point. Uh, what's this guy going to do? He's already accused us really being spies. I mean, after all, remember, his brothers are the ones that set up that whole group of people and went in and murdered them because one of them raped, or raped their sister, basically. So these are guys that are pretty used to getting their own way. They've kind of matched their match now. And they're, they're, their younger brother really knows their character. And these are not good moral characters, you know, as Russ has pointed out. And these guys are, you know, it's not that they're tremendously bad, but they're just doing whatever it takes to get their way. That's why they sold their brother off. That's why they murdered all those people in that city. And, you know, that's got to have been on Joseph's mind. You know, he's thinking about all these things. And he tells them if they want to, if, and he knows how long, remember, he knows how long the, the famine's going to last. So like I said, we're at least probably, I would really be surprised it's less than three years into the famine. So we probably have four more years at least. It might have only been two. But, you know, they would have had enough, Everybody back then would normally have more than enough food to last a year plus. Because if you had a bad year, you're just out of luck. No grocery store, no Walmart to go get your food at. So you always had excess stored up for those bad times. And even with the famine, it wasn't completely no crops. They were just very poor crops, remember? It weren't that there weren't any cows. They were just scrawny, ugly cows that didn't have much meat on them. And the grain that did grow was just kind of hit and miss. If you've ever seen pictures of scorched corn in a, during a drought, it has a few kernels on an ear, but not very many. And the ears aren't very big. <clears throat> but he tells them, if you come back, you've got to bring my little brother. Or don't come back. And he doesn't call him his little brother, but he says their younger brother. So when they get home, Dad said, there ain't no way. I already lost my favorite son. You're not taking the baby to family. That's all there is to it. And food gets really tight. And their dad says, you got to go back and buy it. And they said, we can't go without our brother. He won't, he won't talk to us. He won't sell to us or anything else. And so he allows, that to, to, allows them to take his little brother. And the, uh, you know, if you think about it, that was very hard for his dad to do. He was worried the whole time. And, you know, that's when Joseph really, when he sees his little brother, because remember, his little brother didn't do anything wrong to him. That's when he breaks down. He's just overcome with the emotion seeing his brother. But, you know, he gets his brothers. <laughs> I mean, he really gets them. When he has his little brother arrested and brought back, and uh, he tells him, I, I got him, y'all go home now, it's okay, don't worry about it. They know their sins have come home to roost. And of course, eventually he reveals himself, and they go back home. He sends, it's <clears throat> Pharaoh, Pharaoh, uh, they, he sends back for his, for his dad, and then Pharaoh finds out that his brothers are there, and he sends the the wagons and things. But just think about it. Joseph really had his, he didn't kill them or anything, but boy, he got them good. You know, now Joseph was a good guy, don't get me wrong. But you know, sometimes it just really bugs us when somebody gets advantage of us. And he didn't do anything like kill them or lock them up in prison, but boy, I tell you, he got his brothers. 
That was all part of God's plan. And we don't understand it. But I mean, when I, that's how when I look at it, that's what I see. He, he sort of got his vengeance. Not quite. But I mean, that's part of what I see is that he had an opportunity to take it out on his brothers. And he did. And you may not agree with me. And that's okay because I don't know either. It doesn't tell us that. It just tells us a story about what happens between him and his brothers. <clears throat> In fact, Pharaoh had told them that he, could, he needed to go send and get his dad and save him from the famine. You know, that, that's how much he thought of Joseph. Was he told Joseph, he, you know, you go get your family you got to save them for, you got to save your family from the famine because he knew how much was left too. And you know, it, it, none of us have ever been through a famine. None of us are really old enough to understand the Dust Bowl. I don't know if we have anybody even old enough to live back then. Maybe Larry back then. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the depression, maybe. But I mean, you know, we just can't, we can't relate to that. You know, our biggest problem was after the hurricane when Walmart didn't have anything on the shelves. Come on. And most of us were out of town then. You know, or during this epidemic of COVID, they didn't have toilet paper at HEB, you know. I mean, that's our worst challenge. Our challenge has never been, where's our next meal going to come from? And there's not any crops growing in the field. There's no animals. You know, there's no wild game. I mean, any of them went, but they didn't bring back anything. So, I mean, I don't know about those guys. <laughs> they went hunting and left the animals. So, I guess for next year. They wanted to grow bigger horns, I guess what it was, right? <laughs> the, uh, the thing is, we've never been in a situation like that. We really can't put ourselves in. I can't anyway. Not really. You know, hungriest I ever been is when I skip a meal. And it's, that's by choice. Or because I'm busy, not because there's nothing to eat. But that's the situation these people lived in. And God provided a way to take care of his people. Because what was his promise to Abraham? He's going to bless them, right? He's going to take care of them. Bless those that bless you. Curse those that curse you. And he said... He, he didn't say, you're going to inherit this land while you're in it. He said, you're a sojourner in this land. Eventually, you're going to, your descendants are going to inherit this land. So God had a plan. And when he sent them down to Egypt, part of, part of that was, was the Egyptians, to be honest with you, they just didn't like foreigners. Okay, They didn't intermarry with them. They didn't, have any of that. They didn't, they didn't put up with any of that. So these people come to, come to Egypt, they're going to be an isolated group of people. And we see this in God's hands. Now, in, in chapter 47, when uh, Joseph's uh, dad and them, the family comes, it's the whole family. Now, how many people are there? Seventy, right? It's not a real big family or nation, but it's the beginning of one. And, he, and they come in, and uh, Pharaoh wants to meet his brothers. And he brings them in, and uh, he tries to coach them in what to say. And what, what was his concern? Y'all remember that? Yeah, Egyptians don't like shepherds. They're cattlemen, and they don't like sheep. Sounds like the West, right? Those people just don't belong here. Now they come in and tell them they're shepherds. But you see God's hand in this. And Pharaoh tells them, they, in fact, they asked Pharaoh about this land we came through. Very green. Very, looks like a good pasture land. And we'd like to put our, flo our flocks over there. And Pharaoh decides to give it to him. And he says, on top of that, he says, uh, how about them taking care of my livestock? He knows that everything Joseph does is blessed. He fears part of the family too, you know. They got to be good herdsmen. In fact, if they're bringing sheep with them from the famine, they got to be doing pretty good. Just think about it. You know, they, they've sent somewhere else to get food 
and they managed to keep their sheep alive. God was taking care of them. Sometimes we, we miss all that in the big story. We don't think about the little things that go in where we see God's hands in a lot of this. You know, because normally by this point, you've already eaten most of your livestock, maybe kept a horse to pull the cart or something, or an old cow or something. But probably sheep wouldn't have been very high up on that list of animals you needed to keep and trying to find grazing land for them. And then we see uh, Pharaoh's going to meet Joseph's dad. So what's the... Uh, Russ asks, uh, when Joseph introduces his father to Pharaoh, what does Jacob do? He blesses him. That's, and you know, Pharaoh had no idea what that really meant, did he? But God had told Abraham, whoever he blessed, he would bless. So this is going to be a good thing for Pharaoh. And we, and then, uh, you know, if you think about it, here's the guy that's the, the king of kings, the lord of lords of all the lands at this point. And here's this humble little shepherd guy comes in. He treats him as an equal, mainly because of his son. The influence that his, that his son had had on Pharaoh and his, his kingdom. So then, so from that point, we see them move off to Goshen and develop their own tribal deal. But the grain's going, the famine's going on, and it's getting worse. So what happens? If you're hungry, or you don't have food, what do you do? You gotta go see Joseph. That's his job, to distribute the food. The only thing is, it's not free. You notice that? Pharaoh took it from you, he put it in his barns, now you gotta buy it back, even if you're an Egyptian. So the first year, people gather up the jewels and the gold, and they buy the food. And the next year, what do they do? Yeah, bring in the cattle and whatever else they've got. Give them to Pharaoh. Now, if you know anything about history, at this point, Pharaoh's about to own everything. He's got all their gold, all their animals, and then the third year comes along and the people don't have anything else left to sell, but what? Their land. This is when Pharaoh literally begins to own the entire kingdom of Egypt. And we see it in the great pyramids and all the projects that were done. Because I mean, not only did he have the slaves, slaves later to build those things, he had all the wealth. And so for three years, everything goes okay. And now the people are hungry. It's the fourth year, might be the fifth of the famine, we don't know. And this doesn't necessarily mean that, that this happened after Jacob, I mean, after his dad and everybody got there, it could have happened before that. It's just how, about the famine. And then we get to this fourth year, they don't have anything left to sell. Man, there's nothing else they can do. They go to Pharaoh, they say, what are we supposed to do? He says, go see Joseph, whatever he tells you, that's what you have to do. So what, what did Joseph tell him? He made them sharecroppers is what he made them, right? You work the land for Pharaoh, whatever crops you get, you get to keep... 20% of it, I mean 80% of it, and you got to pay Pharaoh 20% of it. That's pretty fair and reasonable wages, to be honest with you, for a sharecropper. And you get to live on the land. And I'm sure those people thought that was great. And they got whatever else they needed food-wise. But that became the rule. You know, first, first hear about that, really, when he's collecting the surplus. 
But now it's put in force, okay? And so, you know, mankind is not generally that generous to his fellow man that's down on his luck. If you want to know the truth of the matter. People usually take advantage of poor people. But Joseph does it. We see the hand of God in this. Joseph says, work the land. You get to keep 80%. The king only wants 20%. And that's a pretty good deal. I mean, they had to work. Don't get me wrong. They didn't get to uh, own the land or anything. But they had a pretty good deal. They had a house. And they had food. And I guarantee you, if you were starving, that would be very important to you at that point in your life. And, uh, and we see that. Let's see. Uh, Oh, yeah, now we get to the, to the last part. Uh, what, uh, think about it. what was God doing to Jacob in Egypt? Or Israel, whatever name you want to call him. Oh, yeah, he lived a long time. Yeah, he's seen his people multiply their wealth. You know, they didn't have to sell off their livestock. We don't see anything about them selling off their jewels or anything else. I mean, they didn't own the land, but I mean, they weren't as, probably as poor, as bad off as the other people. But then he gets to the end of life, and what promise does he extract from his boys? He says, I'm dying. Don't bury me in Egypt. I don't want to be buried here. I mean, after all, his son's the right-hand man of Pharaoh. You can imagine the funeral they would have put on and all the stuff they would have done. He says, I want you to take me back and bury me with my people. Why do you want to be buried there? And where was it? It was the cave. Yeah. Where his, where his ancestors were buried. And where was that at? Not, the, not what the name of it was. That was in the promised land. Right? That was why. He wanted to go back to the promised land. He made his sons promise that he, that he would go back. And so when he died, his son had all embalmed, just like the Egyptians do. And in Pharaoh, he had great respect for him and for his son, he sent basically the army with them to make sure Joseph's dad got buried where he wanted to be buried. You know, this is the largest military might in the world, and you're in a small little country, and they come knocking on your door and say, by the way, we're here to bury this guy in the cave. Are you going to say no? You see the hand of God in all this. Now, if Joseph and his brothers, you know, and a couple of hundred of them had come down there to bury their dad, it might have been a different story how they were uh, accepted. But when Pharaoh's army basically shows up, and it's this entire entourage, nobody's going to cross Pharaoh at this point in, in the Egyptian power. I mean, as we see all the way up to almost Nebuchadnezzar, Egyptian is, Egypt is still a major military power. That's who you went to when you want to hire an army to defend your land. And at this point, they were certainly the military power of the world. So, I mean, we just see that we see the, this whole story. You see the hand of God, but you see a young man that remains faithful. And no matter how successful he is, he never forgets where it came from. And that's important for all of us to get that message because it's easy to get sidetracked. I mean, the job he had was pretty time-consuming, I'm sure. Any other comments? Well, let Russ cover everything I missed. How's that? <laughs> Thanks a lot for your attention.